Okay, fine. <clears throat> uh, you look good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if my shoes are not showing, that's good. I have to polish them. Oh, uh, yeah. I know it goes down till here or so. Yeah, yeah, that's good. All right, that's good. That's fine. Okay, fine. So, again, okay, we're going to discuss. Now, you want me facing you or facing the camera? A little bit of both. Okay. A little bit of both. You can speak here, you can speak here, you can speak there, whatever, whatever you're good with. Yeah, okay. Uh, fine. So, so, we're starting over here at around. Uh, okay, fine. So we're ready. You ready? Yeah. <coughs> Rabbi Eliel Bergstein, renowned lecturer, amazing, inspiring rabbi, is our guest tonight at the Chazak Network. Rabbi Eliel Bergstein, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank I'm you very, very much. To be here. It's our pleasure. Rabbi Bergstein, so uh, we're wondering, how did it all start? Were you always Rabbi Eliel Bergstein with a beard or... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I was always Eliyahu Bergstein, Eliyahu Bergstein but the rabbi somehow uh, was added on at a later time, as was the beard, which was originally black. Oh, really? Yes, 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 <laughs> it was. And what if it all started, you could say, I'm, I'm very standard. I mean, if you interview somebody, you want to have something that's something out of the world. But I'm pretty standard. I went to a regular yeshiva katana, a regular yeshiva high school. Um, actually... Uh, yeshiva kind of high school, and at about age 17. Which high so, school is this? Chafetz Chaim. Oh, Chafetz Chaim. Right, oh, right, right. Not in its current location, at the old location right, on right. the other side of Forest Hills, Queens. Yeah. Um, I was there for high school, and uh, I actually, while in high school, gravitated a little toward the Chesidish style. Mm. Uh, which in Chafetz Chaim is not the style. <laughs> and uh, after high school in Chafetz Chaim, I changed to Tervadas. Tervadas is a little different style of yeshiva. Kula Mahu in, 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 in Kensington. Okay. Everyone is fine and good. Everybody yeah, has their derech. Yeah. Everything's good. But that was more suitable for me. And uh, I learned Tervadas. I never went to any of the great exotic places which, you know, bring out big Torah <laughs> scholars and... Uh, when I got married, I became a Malamid. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, you, you had a Shaykh as a connection with any of the Torah of Adas, uh, Rabbein, uh, Rashish? Well, I did learn by Rabbi Zelig Epstein, Zechariah Lavrocha. Was it Rabbi Zelig Epstein from Shari Torah? Yeah, before he was in Shari Torah, he was in Torah Oh, yeah, okay, that's yeah, good yeah, to know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I learned by Rav Pam, Zechariah oh, Lavrocha. Oh, right. He was not Rosh Hashiva then. Rabbi Gedal Yeshua was the Rosh Hashiva. Mm -hmm. Rav Pam gave a shia. Uh, I remember even it was Baba Basra that I learned in the year by Rav Pam. And Rav Pam used to say on Fridays a, uh, like, a, on the Pasha, kind of Musr, in uh, Yonam of the Pasha, always with a real strong message, but delivered in the softest way. That's what he was so, known for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I'll tell you something else about Rav Pam. Sure, when he... Fahed, when he tested the boys on Friday, these are boys that are 19, 20 years old. If he asked the question, if somebody was like not looking straight at him but looking down into the Gemara like they're trying to figure out what it is, he wouldn't call on them. He, it, the idea of the test was not to make anybody embarrassed. The idea was to bring out the best, not bring out the worst. Unbelievable. And uh, that, that's, uh, that's a lesson for all of our uh, teachers out there. <laughs> it, sure, it sure is. It sure is. Powerful. Right? There's actually a Gemara in Tainus that says about a certain Malamed who was able to daven and it rained all the time when he davened that uh, he, they, they asked him, what's your kaya? Secret. What's, what's, your... what's your secret? What's, what's, what, what is your strength that you daven? And he said that he's a malamed of little kids and he teaches the poor children as well as the rich children. He doesn't differentiate. And if a kid isn't learning well, he has a little a fish pond that he gives the kid fish and he talks to the kid and he, he calms the kid down until his, the kid is ready to learn. So that was his educational methodology. Raf Pan probably used that on a, on a high level on, you know, for, for the 20 year old boys. That, um, uh, that was Raf Pan. Others had influence on me too. I mean, I used to go at that time to everyone. In other words, I made it a point of going to everyone. I, mean, I could list off names here. From end to end, Rav David Lifshitz, Rav Yosef Breuer, Rav Shimon Schwab, the Klosenberger Rebbe, the Satmer Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Baba Veruv, the 
It's the gene. Everyone. Scully, uh, on and on. Uh, as you, a you, you, you yes, yeah, I went to all of them. I tried to learn from all of them. I, I tried to have a shaykhus with all of them. There are more. I don't want somebody to think I mentioned uh, only those yeah. and, and not others. Um, and uh, I, I would try to frequent a lot of different places and get a lot of things from a lot of places. Um, Tarva does actually is originally that style because Rabbi Shraga Feivel Mendelovich he was encouraged the founder. boys, the founder of Tarva, I don't know if he was founder, but he was uh, the person who put it big time on the map. Right. He would uh, take from various places and incorporate that into his Yiddishkeit, a uh, sort of uh, uh, a rainbow uh, Yiddishkeit. Of, Interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Very different, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. After my chasana, I became a malamid. Uh, a, a teacher? A teacher, yeah. A rebbe? A rebbe. Where were, where were you a rebbe? I was a rebbe in Yeshiva Kal in Stalin, oh. in Borough Park. And I, it would be worthwhile mentioning my mentor in Chinuch, Rabbi oh. Meir Pilchik, all of us The first year in my uh, being a malamid, I was right after my chasana, and Rabbi Pilchik was the Kita Aleph Malamed. Everybody wanted him. He was great. There were 51 kids in the class. Wow. So he needed what they called up a helper, an assistant. Wow. So I served as his assistant that full year. I saw how he dealt with kids. A kid forgot to put on their tzitzis. So a five-year-old, what would he do? He'd call the kid over, and while they said the brach on the tzitzis, he would tell the kid to hold on to his tzitzis. He wouldn't tell the kid, why didn't you bring your tzitzis? Go back home and... <laughs> no, 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 you hold on to my tzitzis, and tomorrow you'll bring your tzitzis. After that, the next year and the years after that, I had my own class. I moved up to Kitta Beis, to Kitta Gimel. I ended up staying a few years in Stalin. Then I went, I became a Malamed, the teacher, a elementary school teacher in Bobov, in Barra Park also. And uh, I was there for a couple of years in Kitta Gimel. I make a joke sometimes that uh, I spent 16 years in elementary school. <laughs> eight years as a student and eight years as a <laughs> teacher. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, my voice uh, had a tough time though at uh, teaching. Uh -huh. It's very strenuous. It's, uh, it's not an easy job. It's mm -hmm. a wonderful job, a rewarding job. And anybody who's a Malamed a teacher in elementary school should know what they're doing is great. But I had to leave the field because my voice was um, weak. In the weak, sense. yeah. I did, though, keep a um, kesher a connection to teaching because after I stopped being a Malamed teacher in elementary school and I went into my current job in computer programming, which it's my side job Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, <laughs> then I uh, started giving classes in a shul in Borough Park on 18th Avenue. I used to give picky of That was your first, uh, I guess, besides for elementary school teaching, that was your first experience in giving over... Lectures to adults, to adults yeah. basically, because uh, the only experience I had with older, older before that was occasional here and there, but nothing uh, so this significant. Was really, your first right. So I started Friday nights in the winter, the Pasha, the portion of the Chumash, right. Right. and uh, Shabbos afternoon in the summer, the Pirkei Avos, uh, Ethics of the Fathers, loosely translated, and uh, for many years I did that. And during the course of those years that I was giving that class in Borough Park, I also started teaching what they call Kira Vachaykim. Mm, doing outreach. Outreach, right. So that's, uh, yeah, that's this is going back how many years? Would you... uh, this is going back about uh, 25, 26 years. Uh, at that point I started teaching outreach. Mm -hmm. It, this was in association with with Asia Ish. Taira. That's correct. Now the way that happened is a little odd. We went on. My wife and I went on our first real uh, major vacation to the Canadian Rockies, and I went to Edmonton for Shabbos. And the rabbi in Edmonton was then Rabbi Yitz Wine, who later was in Las Vegas and various Ish places. And he asked me, "Well, oh, a guy comes from Brooklyn. He must say a few words by Shalashudas." <laughs> So I said a few words by the third meal on Shabbos afternoon in the shul, and he said to me, uh, you know, there's an organization called Asia Torah that has a program called Discovery that's right near you in Brooklyn that needs teachers. When you get back, contact uh, Rabbi Avraham Gottman, 1305 Coney Island Avenue, that was their <laughs> office at that time, back then, and... Uh, 
I came there, and uh, they said, okay, let's see if you can learn the material. They gave me material, this and this age material. The Discovery Seminars. Yeah, it actually started with codes, the codes of the Torah, which right, you're familiar with. Right, and then little by little, I learned the other ones. And um, I started uh, teaching, and I'd say since then, I must have done discovery programs uh, somewhere between 700 and 1,200 times. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's over 25 years, uh, but a lot of times, and there was certain years when we were doing 60, 65 full or partial or mini discoveries uh, during the course of a year. Discovery Seminaries, with what we understand, started as a whole weekend, which started, I believe, on Thursdays all the way till Sunday? Yeah, it started, actually, I believe, originally as a whole week. Wow. And we found out quickly that people weren't quite ready for the whole week. <laughs> and then we tried a weekend, and not everybody was actually ready for that either. Wow. We did, for many years, full-day discoveries. That was like 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. or 4.30, with a lunch break, with questions, with this and this. Uh, it would change from being a slide presentation to a PowerPoint presentation somewhere down the line. Uh, we ended up actually creating a two and a half hour don't blink discovery with no break, without the codes, with material concentrated that was suitable mostly for college campuses, universities. You get the kids at night in a certain program, whatever the college program is and uh, can make a big impact. And we, we've big had the rabbi do that for Chazak, uh, I think a few times, and it was powerful, inspiring. Yeah, yeah, it's very good. It makes you, number one, like appreciate, and number two, it makes you want to get involved and show this amazing proofs to others. Yeah. So the discovery seminars are definitely unbelievable. So that was, uh, that. it's funny, from Canada, you got introduced to Aish, which was in your backyard in Brooklyn. Uh, I lived a 20 minute walk from that office <laughs> and I went 2,000 miles for Rabbi Yitz Wine to tell me the office is 20 minutes from your house, <laughs> go there, they want you. They were initially skeptical because you know you have to learn the material exactly, um, but Baruch Hashem, uh, that also led to me teaching more at Aish altogether right. and I did a Pesach, uh, pre-Pesach set of classes at Aish New York and then, Baruch Hashem, they asked me to teach regularly on uh, once a week. So we had a Chumash class at Aish once a week for a number of years. We actually covered 40 people in attendance once a week from the beginning of Bereshis till Aseris Adibro, so so Pashas Yisrael, middle of Shemos approximately, in over the course of about five years. That's amazing. Yeah, it was very good. and. Um, it actually got recorded, but I still have it at home on those little discs. Okay, so yeah, you have asked me a few times yeah, yeah. if you can do something about that. that okay, we have to we'll have get to see about that. Yeah. Whoever's yeah. listening in there, if you have those uh, uh, transfers, let us know. <laughs> do something eventually with it. But, I, I will mention to you, though, that the discovery material and similar similar material about key, about Mamad HaSinai, uh, ha -ha uh, Mount Sinai, and the... Uh, Veri verification and truthfulness of Torah and the events of Sinai and the evidence pointing to Hashem and Hashem's Torah and all of this is not only today suitable and uh, necessary for Kira V'chaikim for bringing in people who don't have a background but in our own environment of yeshivas and Beis Yaakovs and boys and girls in, who are already religious the material is needed there too, and more and more it's being incorporated into those kind of schools. I mean, I've done discovery style material in many boys and girls schools, yeshivas, and yeshivas in, in yeshivish places, so to speak, in chasidish places. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And even if it's not that material, sometimes it's my own material on tefillah, prayers, Shabbos, Chinuch, education, things like that. It's that style material that are things which, you know, everybody knows that. No, 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 no. Uh, Not everybody knows that and everybody wants to it, hear it. Even if they know it, it's worth repeating. Absolutely. It's worth repeating to get them... Yeah. I, I personally remember in Yeshiva having these various different guest lectures and they would come and speak about these topics. I was like so, you know, glued into this stuff. So Rabbi Berkson, we spoke a little bit about your lectures and how you became a lecturer, how you spoke in Aish. 
Uh, why don't we go a little bit of rewind and speak a little about the mishpacha, the family, wife, the kids, living, etc. Baruch Hashem. I live in Muncie, and my kids, Baruch Hashem, are all married, and none of them live in Muncie. <laughs> 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 That's hilarious. That's unfortunate the way it is. That's the way it is. That's yeah. okay. All yeah. right. They don't live that far. Sometimes I tell people, you know, about that. They said the same with me. And I have one kid. Somebody will tell me they have a kid in Israel and in Australia and in Baltimore and in Montreal. <laughs> I say no, no problem. All my kids are either in Borough Park. Or my son, who is in Kiryas Yoyo. Uh, it's not so, so bad. It's, from Muncie, we're talking either way, is an hour, an hour and a half. So they say, that's not far. I say, but it's not walkable on Shabbos. <laughs> but I'm okay with that. And uh, I have one international. One Wonderful. international is one of my grandsons lives in Toronto. So Toronto. Uh -huh. That's as international as I get. Uh -huh. um, I will say that my kids are all Hasidish, but of very, in various groups. They're not in one particular place. I have in Bobov and in Bells and in Kalin and in Satva. <laughs> it's a free, it's free. The UN. It's a little bit of it. And truthfully, in Yiddishkeit, everything's the same. That's true. It, it, there's no difference if somebody is Hasidish or Yeshivish or Ashkenazi or Svaradi or Taimani. In the end, the Orach HaShulchan even says it in, in his Sefer, in his book, that you are one, your people are one, it's all really one. It's the same shop, it's the same tefillin, the same don't kill, don't steal, under your mother and father. It's, the styles are not really... Uh, Customs. It's not, not, not showstoppers. It doesn't matter if you sing Mizmor Le David one time or three times. Whatever your custom is, it's good. Um, but Baruch Hashem and... Uh, None of my children are in chinoch uh, in educational jobs, except my, my son, who's a rov. But uh, where, where is he a rov at? In Kiryas Yoel, ah, in Satmar. Oh, very nice. Yeah, so he has yeah. the... People ask me, how do you get to Satmar? I said, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> By me, it's okay. How did I get to where I am? Right. My father was a, a, a Litvish rov. My father was a oh, really? yeshivish man. He had learned, my father learned in... Uh, in uh, Hebron before the Second World War. Really? Yeah, wow. yeah. So, you know, he gave me the leeway. I went to Tavadas. I gravitated into, uh, you know, the that kind of a setting. So it's okay with me. Doesn't doesn't really matter. Where was your father a rov at? In, in he was actually a rov in Woodside, Queens. Oh, really? For forty-two years. Interesting. Yeah, cool. yeah. Is there any Jewish community? Uh, the, at its best, best in the mid and late sixties. There was a Shaima Shabbos minion, but most of the time there wasn't. Mm -hmm. My father's attitude was the Torah was given in the Midbar, in the desert, so he can be a rabbi in a place that's a little bit sort of a desert, in a Midbar. <laughs> and it didn't matter. And so he, that's where you grew up? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He had actually an attitude which is good for Kirov altogether. That's His attitude was, in Yiddish he used to say, It's God's world, let him worry about it. His attitude was, I do what I can, I do the best I can, I try, bar mitzvah boys, you know, the Hebrew school, try to get them into yeshivas, this and that, and if it works, good, and if it doesn't work, it's up to Hashem. And I think that's what gave him the uh, actual the stamina to stay in the same congregation with the same challenges for 42 years because he had that equilibrium. He used to greet every single Jewish person on Shabbos by saying to them either good Shabbos or Shabbos. I once asked him what that is. Yeah, well, he said to, to the people who are Shabbos observant, he says good Shabbos. To the others... How can he say good Shabbos? So he just says, Shabbos, like to let them know, you know. Good Shabbos. He once said, it's his macho, it's his protest against the uh, little Shabbos. All right, but it was, that's the way he did it. And uh, he was there many years. Uh, but I gravitated in my way, and uh, I actually think that a, a rabbi of a congregation or a communal rabbi or a teacher in yeshiva does much more than me as a lecturer and speaker and inspirational speaker because they are day in and day out as a rabbi with the congregants, as a teacher with the students, with a all big challenge. If you come in and make a speech for one hour and it's very inspiring and very exciting, I'm, I'm all with it and that's great. Right. But if you can sit in a classroom with seven-year-olds 
every day for hours and hours, and at the end of the year you produce the product, where in the beginning of the year they didn't hardly know olive base, and at the end of the year they already uh, know how to read a cinder properly, or something like that. that, that, that that's, uh, it's, they say, kalakavod, you know. Same good. kids, day in, day right, out, right. same congregation, same. Uh, that's same congregation, same way. And as a teacher in yeshiva, September starts again, Oidcha, you got a new set. Now let's see what you can do again. Oh wow. But you know what it does do for you? It does do for you that years and years later, like where I am now, I can get a 50-year-old guy who comes over to me and says, Hi, Rebbe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's you. No, yeah, I remember you. Yeah, yeah I remember you. You were sitting in the yeah, second yeah, row. The second row. Right, right, right. That's great. My own son-in-law was in my class, actually. One of my oh, sons wow. Look at that. I was, his, I was his kid, the Gimel teacher, third oh grade teacher. Gosh. Yeah, so it's so good. Cool. I wrote good report cards for him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. That is hilarious. So Rabbi Bergstein. Why don't you give us, you know, you've been speaking here and there and everywhere, some sort of a story or a message or an inspiring thought that you feel sticks out. I figured you were going to ask me something <laughs> like that, and I thought about it last night already, and I actually will tell the following incident, which has a story in it, which I think Everybody loves covers everything. Okay, beautiful. And this is exactly as it happened. Aish sent me years ago to do a discovery program in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Lancaster? Uh, yeah, you was yeah. there? Uh, yeah, actually, I was once there for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur as a chazan. You're a chazan also? Well, uh, oh, I didn't know that. I'm a chazan for Erev Yom Kippur. <laughs> it's like Afka Paris. It's, it's good for, you know, um, I mean, whatever it is. But I was there in Degel, Israel. Uh, on Columbia <coughs> Avenue, I think it is. On I was there for one year at Zachazen, and years later we did a discovery program there. They had about sixty people, a real nice crowd. And for you know, this is a small community, and it's a two and a half hour program I'm doing, if I remember correctly. And there's the regulars, regular Jews of that area. Some more religious, some less religious, some more knowledgeable, less knowledgeable. And I start going, and I'm going, no, I'm going to go two and a half hours straight. About ten minutes into the program, a tall young man walks in with a big telescope and a large tzitzis on, woolen, with a beard, with long payas, no jacket, no hat, just like that, with white shirt, looks like somebody, you know, you'd see in Bar Park or Williamsburg or... You know, maybe Kew Gardens Hills, and he sits down at the program. And I'm continuing with the program, but to me, I'm curious, what's this guy doing here? It doesn't look like the locals. At the end of the program, I'm putting myself to put things together, wrapping things up, I'm going out to my car, and he comes out to the car, and he says to me, wonderful presentation. I, I loved it. And... Uh, I want to give you something since you gave me so much. I want to tell you a story that you can use. Now I want to tell you something. I get people telling me a lot of times, I want to tell you a story you can use, and I can't <laughs> use it. But I, I listen. Here he told me a story that I can use and I'm using now. This okay. one, this, um, we're this curious one, to hear this one. This is what he told me. There was a person who went to a rabbi. And he said he wants to see Eliyahu Hanavi. For those who are not familiar, the prophet Elijah is known that even till today, even though he, he lived actually in the time of the first base Amigdish first temple, but he is an unusual person that is actually sent still down on this world for various things. We have a custom to open the door at the Seder for Eliyahu Hanavi. Eliyahu Eliyahu Navi comes to Brisson in some way, shape, or form. Uh, there's stories in the Talmud about people meeting Eliyahu Navi under certain circumstances. Talmud even says, Ha'u Ish, if it's just as a person, sometimes it means Eliyahu Navi. So this person went to a rabbi and said, I want to see Eliyahu Navi. So he said, the rabbi said to him, if you want to see Eliyahu Navi, it's no problem. He writes down an address for him. You go to this address and spend next Shabbos at this address... And you, you'll see. Him. You'll be able to see Eliyahu and Navi. Okay. He looks at the address. It's some address in a different city, a few hours drive. Friday morning, he puts himself together. He comes, he drives, he shows up at that place. 
he sees it's a very dilapidated neighborhood, and the house here is one of the worst in the neighborhood. <laughs> it looks like, you know, real dilapidated. And he knocks on the door. Nobody answers. He knocks louder. It's Friday afternoon. Nobody answers. Finally, somebody comes to the door. A woman comes to the door, opens up the door, says, Yes, what can I do for you? And he says, um, You know, I've been traveling, and I'm a few hours from home. Uh, it's Friday. I I any way I could stay here for Shabbos? She opens the door more wide and, and shows inside the house. It's a poor house. Her husband, who's not well, is sitting in a chair there. He's, whatever his situation is, the, the kids are barefoot. You know, you can welcome to stay here for Shabbos, but... You can find a better place for Shabbos yeah, than this. Yeah. <laughs> we hardly have what to give you. We're making kiddush on the challahs and we have some herring, you know. Oh, don't let that bother you, he says. You know, I'll take care of that. Okay. No problem. I'll be back. He goes and he goes to the store. He buys challahs and fish and wine and kugel and the whole, the whole everything. Uh, a oh, few dollars for Elio and Nobi, no problem. Yeah. He comes there, he spends their Shabbos there, all happy. The family, they haven't had a nice Shabbos like this in who knows how long. And he's waiting for Eliyahu and Obi. Friday night, Shabbos morning. Nothing. Nothing there. Matzah Shabbos after Shabbos. He's so disappointed. The Rebbe told him, here's Eliyahu and Obi. He can't understand it. He bid goodbye for the family. They said, come again, come again. Come, again. come in. Yeah, come every day. Anytime you <laughs> want. He goes back. Next day, he comes back to the rabbi and he says to him, I went there. It's a house. It's a Broken down. Broken down. This, 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 and Elio and Ovi wasn't there. I don't mind the broken down. I slept on a, you know, a, a old mattress. <laughs> but nothing happened. Oh, really? Go back there next Shabbos. You'll see Elio and Ovi. He goes back there. He goes, I'll try it one more time. We'll give this one more shot. <laughs> he comes there Friday afternoon, same time. He's about to knock on the door when he hears screaming inside. Mm -hmm crying, screaming. One of the kids is crying and screaming to the mother. Oh, all week we've been eating this p p potatoes with herring, with old bread, and now Shabbos all we'll have is challah with a little fish and nothing more. Uh, I, 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 I wish we had so much more. And, the, and he's crying. And the mother's trying to calm him down. Oh, it'll be okay. Maybe we can give you an extra piece of fish this Shabbos. And, and you know, she says to the son, and he's listening at the door, maybe Elio Hanovi will come this week just like he came last week. The Yidla was about to knock on the door, and he heard clearly, Elio Hanovi, it's not external. Elio Hanovi's here. He has to be the Elio Hanovi. The Reb has given him a message. You want to see Elio Hanovi? Don't look outside. Look inside to you. <laughs> to me, that says it all. And it happens to be a story that is not only good for the person to understand. Take responsibility. You're the person. You can be the Elio Hanovi. It also says that you have an influence on others. You can't have influence on others. This is the story that this guy told me, standing by my car outside the Discovery Program in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I said to him, yeah, a wonderful story, and I'm going to use it, and I used it here, and I've actually said it before one or two times. And I asked him who he is. And he told me he's a milk mashkiach, for Chol of Yisrael, for the Jewish milk, from whatever the organization was in Baltimore, and that's what he's doing in Lancaster. Mm. Wow. I'm not so sure, though, that really he's not also Elio Anovi. Wow, <laughs> I can marry him. <laughs> know. That is an amazing story. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very uplifting to me, Every too. Every single one of us can be Elio Anovi in his own in way. In way. That's right. That's right. And you can do it even with a small thing. You make care of somebody in a certain way, you, if, if, even if it's a front person already, whatever it is, you smile at somebody, smile you have a good word, word, you know, you don't know how you lift up somebody with, with saying something. Uh, that is unbelievable. Yeah. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this was another Chazak Hour and the Chazak Network and the Chazak Radio. Our guest today was Rabbi Eliyahu Bergstein. Rabbi Bergstein, thank you very much for your inspiring words. Well, I'm, I'm inspired. I'm definitely, everyone listening to this was thank inspired you. as well. And Be'ezat Hashem, you should continue Michal and Chayel. And Be'ezat Hashem, Naseh Ve'natzti. Oh, may Chazak should continue to be Chazak and Chazok. Amen. Amen. Chazak Baruch. Thank you, Rabbi. Amen.